All right, we have Kyle Y. Tonight. Um, one thing about Kyle, um, I appreciate Kyle. He, um, quiet down. Kyle uh, loves you guys. He loves the word. So buckle up. He's ready to go. Yes, sir. How is it going? Does everybody have their Bibles with them? Those of you that have Bibles, keep them handy. We will most likely do some, bring it back to the days of my youth. Uh, when I was growing up, we did something called sword drills. Anybody know what those are? Yeah. Yeah. Show of hands, who's never heard of a sword drill? Okay, okay. 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 We'll explain it when we get there. We'll explain it when we get there, but we will be turning and flipping, so keep your Bibles handy, right? Because we're going to be in Colossians, but we will also establish context through other verses. I'll leave you to explain context on Friday. We'll about 15 minutes. But before we can get into anything about the word, we first have to read it. We first have to understand what it says on a, a base level. So let's read Colossians 2. For I would that you knew what great conflict I have for you. And for them at Laodicea, and for as many as have not seen my face, the face in the flesh. That their hearts might be comforted, being knit together in love, and unto all riches and the full assurance of understanding, to the acknowledgement of the mystery of God, and of the Father, and of Christ, in whom are hid all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. And this I say, lest any man should beguile you with enticing words. For though I be absent in the flesh, yet I am with you in spirit, joying and beholding your orders, and the steadfastness of your faith in Christ. As ye have therefore received Christ Jesus in the Lord, so walk ye in him. Rooted and build it up in him, and established in the faith, as ye have been taught, abounding therein with thanksgiving. Beware, lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit, after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. For in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, and ye are complete in him, which is the head of all principality and power, in whom also ye are circumcised with the circumcision of day without hands, and putting off the body of the sins of flesh by the circumcision of Christ. Buried within the baptism, wherein ye are also risen with him through the faith of the operation of God, who hath raised him from the dead. And you, being dead in your sins, and the uncircumcision of your faith, hath been quickened together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took us out of the way, nailing it to his cross. And having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a show of them openly, triumphing over them in it. Let no man therefore judge you in meat, or in drink, or in respect of a holy day, or of the new moon, or of the Sabbath days, which are a shadow of things to come, but the body is of Christ. Let no man beguile you of your war, reward in voluntary humility and worshiping of angels, intruding into those things which he hath not seen, vainly puffed up by his fleshly mind, and not holding the head, from which all the body by joints and bands having nourishment ministered, and knit together, increases with the increase of God. Wherefore, if you be dead with Christ from the rudiments of the world, why, as though living in the world, are ye subject to ordinances? Touch not, taste not, handle not, which all are to perish with the using, using after the commandments and doctrines of men, which things will which things have indeed a show of wisdom and will worship and humility and neglecting of the body, not in any humor, not in any honor to the satisfying of all right, let's open up with a word of prayer. Dear Lord, dear Holy Father, we, we come to you and we thank you for the first uh, half of the week of camp, Lord. We thank you for bringing us here together and for giving us the weather that we need, Lord. Um, thank you that you know what we need uh, before we even do it. You've given it to us. Uh, I thank you for helping us to be injury-free. I thank you for the great teaching that we've, we've um heard today, Lord, uh, for this whole week, from Pastor Steve and Pastor Spencer and Pastor Pete, Lord. Uh, I thank you for the, for the great speech you have lined up after today. Um, I pray that you will help each one of us to open up our hearts to what you have to say to us, Lord. 
help us attune our 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 minds and our ears to you, Lord. I pray that you would give me your words to speak, Lord. And let every word that proceeds out of my mouth be from you. Take me out of it, Lord. In your son's holy name. Amen. All right. Well, there was a lot there. Um, yeah, there was. Yeah. Yeah, several of them. Uh, does anybody know how many verses Spencer covered last night? Uh, well, he, started, he started in 13 and went to 29, right? So that was about 16 verses. 15, 15 16 verses. He skipped a couple towards the end. Uh, it took him about two hours, right? So if he did 16 verses in two hours, we have 23 verses. So we're looking at what? Three hours? Three and a half? Get around that? No. It will be much shorter than that. Let it ride, Kyle. Let it ride. <laughs> However, we are going to get into what God has for us. So one of the things that I like to do in my own personal study um, is go back to the Greek word. Um, I learned this from Drew over the past several years. Uh, he has a saying that I'm fond of. He says that reading the Bible in English is like reading in black and white. However, reading it in Greek is like reading it in color. You get more of the picture. Not that black and white is wrong, but that with the Greek, you get more of an understanding. So we're going to go through today. We'll define a few Greek words. We'll go through those and how they apply to this text here. Uh, the first one that we're going to talk, talk about, and Pete covered it a little bit this morning, uh, is in verse 1, uh, verse, chapter 2, verse 1. For I would that you knew what great conflict I have for you, and for them in Laodicea, and for as many as I have not seen my face in the flesh. What does the word conflict mean here? We talked about it a little bit this morning. Anybody remember? Yeah, kind of. Kind of like an argument ish. What about pirates? What about, what about pirates that are conflict? Mm, kind of. The word here is agon or aguan. Agon. Uh, which refers to an athlete's struggle or a grueling fight. It refers to uh, it refers to you as an athlete striving for something. You want to win, and so you are putting forth all of your might in it, no matter what you're going up against. Sam, you play football, right? Yeah. Were there teams you went up with that were better than you? They may, you may have won most games, but were there people against that you that you personally were better than you or about equal skills? Yeah. And what did you have to do? Yeah. You had to beat them, right? You had to use all of your, your might. Did you go, eh, I'm only going to run part of the way, you know, when you're going out for a pass, or did you full sprint? Well, exactly. Yeah, I get yelled at it, exactly, yeah. It would be like any other day he gets yelled at. <laughs> Paul here, his conflict for him, is, the conflict is... He is striving for them. He is putting forth his every effort possible in order to give them everything that they need. Um, yeah, when you're in competition, when we're doing uh, games, slip and slide, dodgeball, when we're doing uh, frisbee, do you guys hold back? Do you? Do you, do you win if you hold back? I know, exactly. Most of the time, you're going to use all of your might to win. Did anybody play frisbee golf today? This golf today. Mm -hmm. And Thank yeah, you. you all played. Did you all play with half your might, half your strength? No. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> everyone out there. We get it. Everyone off the tee box hugged it as hard as they could. It may have went this way, this way, or this way, but they went, they used all of their might. The same idea here. Peter Paul is pouring himself out for them. Um, so what the verse says is, for I would that you know what great of a struggle that I go through for you. That you know how much I strive and I press for you. Uh, his love for the church, which he has never even met, this specific subgroup of people he has never met, um, he is suffering for them. He is pushing himself for them, distraining and struggling for them. Um, Paul will do anything to help them because of the love that he has for them. The question is, why does he love them? Why does he strive for them? Uh, what is the purpose of it? So in verse 2, we see that their hearts might be comforted, being knit together in love. We were talking about this in small groups today, and Simeon brought up a really good point, because we talked about first the shirt, the illustration that Pete used today, earlier, right? Your shirt is knit and woven together with, with thread. And then we use the illustration of trees, right? How their roots need to go down into the, 
to the earth so they can grow up and, and grow big, strong, and, and be strengthened, right? We also did use Minecraft for illustration. There were several of them. But the two together were knit and trees, right? I don't know if you guys know this, but when trees send their roots down, they also intertwine their roots. There are a few areas of trees where they span hundreds of feet and maybe even miles. I can't remember off the top of my head what they were, but it is one tree. There's several trunks, but because their roots have been intertwined so much, it is one tree. Even in this, this forest out here, these woods out here, the larger trees are intertwining the roots with the smaller ones, giving them extra strength. When um, the winds come, the smaller trees can lean on the roots of the bigger ones. The bigger ones are going to give nutrients to the smaller trees around them. Being knit together is like that root system. We all here need to be knit together so that way when, uh, when you are having a tough time, right? When you are having a, a hard time, right? The rest of us can come together, give you strength, give you nutrients. You can lean on us to get you through that. That way when I'm having a tough time, a difficult time, I can lean on you guys to help me through that, that difficult time. One of the best things that we have about the Christian body is each other. Um, God has given us a fellowship together in order to get through those difficult times. There's nothing that none of the leaders in here and most of the other Christians in here would not do for you. If you go, hey, I'm struggling with this. I know for a fact each one of these leaders in here, from Pastor Pete all the way down, uh, if you come to them like, hey, I am having this issue. This is a problem that I have. I have this question. We will work. We will help you through it. We are those roots. Utilize us. Uh, now, next point. We have to note uh, some differences. Um, Pete touched on this uh, this morning when he was talking about uh, the hearts and the bowels, or the gut and the mind. Where did we say that the emotions came from? Where did, where did the Hebrews say the emotions came from? No, the gut, right? That's why when you have you heard, heard, heard the expression butterflies in your stomach or something in your pit in your stomach? Yeah. Have you ever been so worried and so anxious about something like your belly, your stomach just hurts, right? You can't really you can't really eat, you kind of you know, kind of it just Yeah, can feel like a washing machine, right? That's where the that's where they say the emotions are coming from. And then where did we say that the Hebrews believe that the most of their um, thoughts come from? Where is your mind? That's what we believe. That's what that's what we think. We know that. Our heart, correct. Yeah. So the Hebrews, when they reference the heart, when they, when they reference, reference the heart in the Bible, they're talking about our mind. They're not talking about our physical beating heart. When they're talking about the guts, when they're talking about our emotions. So we have taken it a step further, a step up, right? We have emotions down here and mind up here. For Hebrews, we have mind up here and emotions here. Um, yeah, so what do we, I mean, so what do we say comes from, come from the heart? Our, you know, our emotions, our love, our compassion, our compassion. We'll say things like, my heart breaks for you, or this is heartbreaking, right? We are referencing our emotions here. Um, so the Hebrews said that the fool saith in his what? There is no God. In his heart, there is no God. Are they saying that there is that they're saying in their emotions that there is no God, that they feel there's no God? Okay. What, did we, what did we just say? What do the Hebrews think come from the heart? Thought. Your thought, correct, yeah. Not your emotions. Your emotions come from your gut when the, the rest of the Hebrews are talking about that. So you can, you can translate that, you can, you can look at that as, as a mind. Turn over to Matthew, oh, okay, you know what? Here's we're going to bring back sword drills. Okay. It's been a long time since I've done this. So everybody get your Bible. Hold it up in the air, right, as far, far as you can. All right, I'm going to call out the reference, and when I say go, you're going to bring the Bible down, flip to it, and when you get to the reference, you stand up or raise your hand, shout out, hey, I got it, and then we'll have you read it out, right? We will, Fred, to keep track, and we'll get the points going, right? All right, so, Matthew 15, 18 to 19. Go. Stand up. Stand up if you got it. Yeah. Stand up. Read it out. 
15, 18, and 19. Yep. 15. Chapter 15, verses 18 and 19. So where do these evil things come from? You're from your mind. Right? Yeah, the heart, which the Hebrews think of them as the mind, right? So we can say, we can read this as, but those things that proceed out of the mouth come forth from the mind, and they defile the man. For out of the mind proceed evil thoughts, murders, adulterous, fornications, thefts, faultless, witness, blasphemies. Out of the mind are where these things come from. Um, just like, and I believe it's John, it says, the fool has said in his heart, or as we would say, the mind. The fool has said in his mind that there is no God. Um, as um, Ms. Esterline, Mrs. Esterline was saying, we, our emotions follow our mind. Uh, they, we are not dictated by our emotions. Our mind dictates our emotions. Sometimes we feel like we're being pulled by our emotions, by our, our anger or our feel or our, our love and compassion. But that's just because where our mind is, that's where our emotions will follow. Uh, all right, you guys ready for another sword drill? Yep. Ready? Everybody, okay. You guys got, you got the gist on the first one, right? Okay, everybody ready? Matt, you have to close your This is going to be in the New Testament. Ready? I, don't, I can't remember. <laughs> ready? The reference is going to be James 4 8. Hold on, hold on, hold on. Is it go yet? Go. Stand up. Oh, stand up. Yep. Why is it always somebody in a hammock? That was good. Hang on, let me. It's because they have the rock pieces inside of the hammock. I think it was the whole thing. Someone said, I don't want to play. Yep. That was that. That was a good one. Um, Alright. Let me. What was it? 4 8. Alright, go ahead. Draw nigh to God, and he will draw nigh to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double minds. Thank you. So, what are we to purify? For to cleanse our hands, our key centers, and to purify our what? Is it, is it, are we to purify our emotions? No, we're to purify our mind. We're to purify our, our heart, is what they say here. And we know that, that they mean the mind here. Uh, you set your heart on something, or you set your mind on something. You purify your mind, and everything else will follow. If you say in your heart, if you say in your mind that, I will do this. This is what I am going to. This is what I'm going to do. This is what I'm going to be and live for. Your emotions and everything else will follow that. Yeah, it may not happen right away because it takes a while to get our brains to go in the direction that we want them to, to bring that under control. But if you, if you put your mind to something, if you purify it, everything else will follow after that. All right, back into Colossians 2. Uh, that your hearts might be comforted, being knit together in love, and unto all riches of the full assurance of understanding, to the acknowledgement of the mystery of God's Father, and, the, and of the Father and of Christ. Paul is striving and struggling here so that your mind might have the truth, that your mind might have the full assurance of understanding. Uh, it's why he... Guys. Pay attention. Thank you. Uh, it is why he talks about wisdom and knowledge in the, in the following verse, in verse 3. In whom is hid all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Right? Who is the whom he's talking about there? What, okay, what part of God? Christ. In Christ. Um, in Christ is all wisdom and knowledge. And we've said it several times this week. What does all mean? Everything. All wisdom, every single piece of wisdom is in Christ. Uh, he literally knows everything. Why would we go searching anywhere else for wisdom? Go to the source. Don't go, and we'll get into, into sources in a few minutes, but why would you ever go anywhere else other than the one who created everything? He has the answers to everything. Why are we going to go, you know what, no, I'd rather not talk to you, I'd rather not get your thoughts on it. I'm going to go over here, right? Well, they don't have all the information. They don't have all the answers. Christ does. Uh, jumping down to, to verse 5, right? So this is what Paul is striving for. This is what Paul is, is struggling for, pushing forth himself entirely to get their minds right, 
so that to help them purify their minds. Um, so that they have all the knowledge that they can get. Um, and this is without him even meeting them. This would be like you guys giving up allowances and giving up your time, your effort, and your energy for some people over in Asia, right? You've never met them. You've never seen them. You probably never will, right? If there's a church over there that you're like, you know what? I'm going to dedicate my time. I'm going to write them. I'm going to write them letters. I'm going to donate them money. I'm going to do as much as I can for them. We've never even seen them. This is the same thing that Paul is doing for them. Because he had Epaphras come to him and say, hey, there's some issues in the church. There's some things that we're facing. And Paul pours himself out entirely for them. Why do we think that is? Because he cares? Yeah. What's, uh, what's another word for cares? Um, passion. Passion? He has a lot of passion for him. That, that, those things wrapped, yeah, loves. Those things are wrapped up in the word love, right? Paul has a great love for the church, even though he's never met them. All right, you ready for one more? All right, Bible's up. Wait, Olivia, what team are you on? Did you get that down? Okay, and Daisy? And black, one for white, one for black. All right, we're going to do several from the same chapter and verse, so I'm just going to give you the first verse, right? First John... 4, 7. Old, 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 old. First John 4, 7, go. Go ahead. Go ahead and start reading it out. Yes. 
It's true. It's true. But you don't sit there and make fun of that need for hurting, right? You go, you get some ice, you go and you go get to a nurse, and they wrap it up, and they take care of it, however they're going to take care of it, and they will, uh, they will fix it. Because when your body hurts, you go and you fix the problem. You go and you do whatever it is to fix the problem. Similarly, because we are one body in Christ, all of us here today are one body in Christ. When one of us is hurting, it affects all of us. All of us should go and, hey, I'm going to go ice that knee. I'm going to go help them out, right? Not physically take them and dump them in a bag of ice, right? But going, hey, you have a need. You have something that I can meet. I can help you with that because we are one body. When you hurt, I hurt. Paul is rejoicing with them here and has a great love of them because we're all part of the same body. We are all servants of the same God. Why would we ever work against each other? Why would we ever bring each other down to look at somebody and to mock them, to look at them and make fun of them, to look at them and hurt them, right? Hey, quiet down. Your attention to quiet. That's what I'm going to say. Um, why would we? Yeah, why would we ever hurt somebody? Why would we ever go out and hit somebody? To go out and mock somebody? To make fun of them and bring them down? We are only hurting ourselves because we are all part of one body. Instead, we should be bolstering them up. They go, oh hey, you're hurting right now. Let me take you and let me let you me pick you up. Let me help you. That's all intro. Uh, Alright, so Paul then goes in and has three sections of warning in this passage, and then he has three responses to them. Uh, we are going to, yeah, verse 4 is the first warning, with the responses being 5 and 7. Verse 8 is the second warning, with uh, 9 to 15 the response, and that's where we'll spend most of our time. And then verse 18 is the warning, with 18 to 23 being the response. So first I'm going to read out the warnings, and then we're going to talk about it a little bit, and then we will go further than that. Uh, so verse 4. And this I say, lest any man should beguile you with enticing words. So no one beguiles us with enticing words. What does it mean to beguile? Trick. To trick? That's a really good, yep, that's a good yeah. line. That's part of it as well. Flattery. Flattery. Uh, flattery could be a form of lying. Could be a form of lying. Uh, anybody else? What does it mean to beguile? Uh, not ridicule, manipulate, kind of. Um, it means to deceive. Right? The Greek word here is paralogizomai, which is the idea of using distorted reasoning to mislead somebody. So taking something that is true, changing it a little bit, or a lot of it, so you have some truth there with a whole lie, with a lot of lie, which, what is that? A lie. Uh, some truth with lie is fully a lie. So it's taking a lie and using it to mislead somebody, to deceive them. And then what does enticing words mean? What does it mean to entice somebody with your words? Intrigue. Intrigue. That's a good. That's a good. Uh, intrigue. Yeah. Trick. Yeah. Possibly, partially. But it means to. It means persuasive speech. Somebody who is great at getting people to listen to them. There's one group of people. Some people call them lizard people, but it's better than the thing. There's one subsection of, of humans who are really great at this, and they worm themselves into this profession really well. Does anybody know what group of people speak with enticing words? It's persuasive speech. They persuade you to do stuff all over. Chick fil A drive through workers. Good That's true. Yeah. Caravan skaters, yes. However, they're part of the larger stuff. That's the second one. A TV ad, yeah. Scammers, I heard that. Liberals. The one I'm thinking of, your parents discuss a lot. Politics. Politicians are some of the best. All right, guys, time to. Politicians are some of the best public speakers you'll ever meet, right? Their entire job, their, what it's morphed into, their entire job has, is to persuade you to vote for them. That's all they care about, is persuading you to vote for them. 
So they are going to entice you with their words to bring you into their line of thinking. So here in verse 4, um, Paul is saying, And this I say, lest any man should deceive you with persuasive speech. Lest anyone should come and mislead you by the sweetness of their words. We'll get into 5 and 6 and stuff a little bit later on, but we're going to go into the next, um, uh, the next morning. And we're going to go a little out of order. So this is going to be verse 18. Let no man beguile you of your reward, in voluntary humility, and in worshiping of angels, intruding into those things which he hath not seen, vainly puffed up by his fleshly mind. So we just talked about it, but what does beguile mean? Deceive. 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 There it is. What reward is Paul talking about here? Eternal life. Um, so eternal life is one of our rewards. That's not the reward that he is talking about here. Why not? How do we know? Because you cannot lose eternal life. The, your salvation is for sure, 100%, when you get saved. Uh, this here says, let no man beguile you of your reward in voluntary humility. We cannot be deceived out of our eternal life. We cannot be deceived out of salvation. Is there such a thing as eternal death? Yes. Hell. Yes. Sin. Yes, that is essentially hell. I can answer that question a little bit fuller. Yeah. We can go into it a little bit more. Um, the rewards here that Paul is talking about are not is not salvation, because we can never lose salvation. Once we are saved, we are saved for all of eternity. I know. The rewards he's talking about here are for finishing the race, for for finishing strong. The rewards here are the the positive things that we do for God that he is going to reward us for. These are the crowns that we're going to toss back at his feet when we, um, when we go to heaven. So Paul here is saying, don't let anybody trick you. Don't let anybody deceive you out of receiving these, these, these ex this extra favor from God. Right? These extra rewards. Not salvation, but the extra things after. Christ is all that we need, and we'll see that in the previous verses and in the following verses. That all we need is Christ, no matter what. Um, that's what Spencer was talking about yesterday. That's basically the entirety of the book is bound up in the thought that, or the, the truth that Christ is all we need. He is sufficient for all. Okay, and then we're going to get into verse 8. And this is where we're going to spend the majority of the time today. Because this is, this verse, I think, it hinges the rest of the book. I think this is why Paul wrote the book. There are several other really good verses and really important and powerful verses, but this, when I'm, when I'm studying it, and I have a bias because I study chapter 2 heavily, it's a whole book, right? Uh, this is what I see the, that hinges everything on. It says, Beware, lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit, after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. So let's break down some of these things. What does it mean to spoil? So if somebody so asks, if, if somebody hey, says, Noah. I want that. Hey, raising that. hands, have guys. Oh, uh, somebody you. says that I want this, and then they'll get it for them. Okay, that's that's one thing. That's that's what we that's what we utilize the word spoil for now. Rotten food. But what did? Yeah, rotten food. That's a, that's a new term we use for spoil. What does Paul mean here? What did it mean to spoil? What were the spoils that they were talking about in Rotten people. Rotten people? Um, not, not really. Leftovers? Kind of. Uh, the spoils here are, uh, think of plunder, or uh, how many of you will play the game, uh, play the game Sea of Thieves? No? Here. Yeah, I just started playing it, so it's on my mind, right? I see. Okay. It's a pirate game, right? Where you go out and you sink other ships, and you go. Uh, but the whole goal of it is to go out and get treasure, or get uh, booty, get spoils, right? The things that you steal from other people are going to be your spoils. Spoil is the, is the idea here is to plunder or to leave captive. Um, this is what a soldier would take after winning their battles. It was called the spoils. Once he won, once the invading army won, they would go into your house and they would take everything they wanted. And that was called the spoils. 
What does Paul mean by philosophy here? Beware lest any man spoil you or, or rob you um, through philosophy and vain deceit. What does philosophy mean? We defined it a little earlier. Love of wisdom. Um, more specifically, the love of human wisdom. Um, the thoughts that we generate. Right? We go, oh, hey, this is what I think, right? Uh, this is the only version of this word used in the New Testament. Um, the idea here is not only the love of wisdom, but the elevation of human wisdom. Taking human wisdom and putting it above what God says. Saying, oh, hey, God's wisdom here, that's fine and great and damn and all, but what I think is better. This is what I think. Mm -hmm. Elevating my wisdom above it. Uh, we're going to still we're going to find a few more terms and we'll put it all together. What does vain deceit mean? That's true. Sort of thing I lost my um, Trick, kind of. Um, that would be the deceit part. That's that's a lie. But what does it mean to be vain? Pointless. Pointless. Yeah. Pointless or empty. Um, I, either one. Uh, vain deceit here is empty lies. Pointless lies. Pointless deceit. Right? Empty deceit. The word here is used as a qualifier um, for philosophy. Um, it is a adjective, adjective, adjective going back to the word philosophy, right? So it is calling philosophy or the elevation of human wisdom empty lies, empty deceit, right? And where do these things come from? Where does this love of, of human wisdom come from? Where do these empty lies come from? Humans, yeah? There's there's two specific ways in verse 8 that we see. The world, what specifically in the world? The, okay, the rudiments of the world, that's my second point, so we'll jump down to that in a moment. Uh, the second source of it is the rudiments of the world. I don't need to define that, right? You guys know what that means? Uh, we talked about it a little bit earlier this morning, um, but it is the basics of the world. The ABCs, right? Think, um, this, where's Eleanor at in her learning? I mean, she... Going into second grade. Going into second grade? It tells me nothing, Eleanor. I spent a lot of time in second grade. She knows how to spell and read and write. Okay, so she's a little bit more advanced, right? So when you're looking here, um, you are less wisdom than Eleanor has right now. Because it's basically, hey, I just learned to count to ten. Right? I don't know that one plus one means two yet, but I just learned how to, I just learned what one is. I just learned what two is. I have no clue what to do with any of them, but I have that, right? I just learned the ABCs. I just learned that song, I put it to the rhythm, and I can sing the song, but I don't know how to spell. I can't look at a grouping of words and read it, because I have just the very basics of it. The rudiments of the world, um, yeah, the rudiments of the world in verse 8, uh, people are trying to use the very basic knowledge they have. Almost nothing, right? If you can only count to 10, will you be able to advance in that class? Yeah. No, you won't even be able to get an entry level. Go a little out, right? People are saying, oh, hey, I can count to 10. I have all this knowledge. I am better than all of you. I am better than God because I can count to 10, right? <laughs> right? Yeah, it's laughable, right? Uh, we don't know anything. Yet. We try to puff ourselves up. Don't leave the wisdom of God to chase after the nothing of the world. Don't take your 8th grade, ninth grade, 10th grade, 11th grade knowledge and education and go, you know what, I'm not going to believe all that. I'm not going to use all that. I'm just going to go sit back in first grade and in pre-K. And I'm just going to focus purely on knowing that, hey, this is one and this is two, right? Don't go back. What is the first source, the, uh, the second source in, in verse 8? The traditions of men. The traditions of men. How many of you ever heard, have you ever asked the question, why do we do this? And the answer is, because that's all how we've always done it. Whether in your life, in jobs, yeah, yeah, you get it all the time. We used to, way back when, in the early days of the church, we used to baptize everybody in a river. Right. We didn't have baptisms, we didn't have heated, heated pools. Is our baptismal heated? Yes. yes. Yeah. We didn't have a nice heated baptismal, that way you're not freezing and shivering. Uh, we went out to a river, and we dumped people in the river, whether it was cold, whether it was hot. 
but we have to chisel ice away, right? Um, as the Christians, we've did that for hundreds of years. Thousands of years, about 1,500 years, right? Does that mean that everybody who is not baptized in a river is not baptized correctly? No, because the river portion of it is a tradition of man. The baptism is from God, right? The baptism is from is from the Lord, and following that is what we should be doing. But how we do it, whether it's a river, or whether it's uh, a baptismal, or we go out to the middle of the Atlantic Ocean and throw somebody in, right? <laughs> that doesn't matter. That's a tradition of man. So I heard the story recently of uh, there was a martial arts expert, right? He was just earned his black belt. And as he was getting ready for a match, he got up and he, he put on his uniform, a gi, he put on his gi and then he took his belt and he wrapped it around and then he wrapped it around again and then he wrapped it around a third time and tied it. He could barely tie it because it was so tight and he had wrapped it around so many times, right? Well, he's like, you know what? I've been studying with this guy for so long and this is what we do every morning when we get there. Why? So he asked his master, he asked, hey, why do we tie it around three times? I mean, I feel like it would make more sense to just do two times, right? And his master looks at him and goes, well, that's just what we do. I mean, you can't change, this is what we do, you dishonor everybody else, right? So he's like, okay. Well, he wasn't satisfied with that, so he goes to his master's master, the guy he learned from, right? Um, and he asks him, and he gets the same response, that, hey, that's just what we do, it's what we've always done, right? He goes, okay, well, I wasn't satisfied with that, so he goes back again. And he went back two or three times, until he found a very old, uh, very old master, and the guy was about this tall, right? He was very short. So he asked him, hey, why do you tie the belt three times? And the master la started laughing, and he goes, because if I tied it two times, the belt would hit the ground. Right? So he would tie it three times, and that's it. And yet other people saw that and go, oh, hey, that's what we're supposed to be doing. And they take that as, hey, this is what we need to be doing. And error started and crept in there, because it wasn't, it wasn't the correct way, or wasn't, uh, the reasoning was not correct. And it goes from there. If there is error in the original thinking, and the original tradition, and it gets passed down, it will get passed down as error, right? If I teach you something incorrect, right? If I teach Matt that one plus one equals three, is that correct? Yes. Well, yeah. no. One plus one is two, it's always been two, always will be two, right? But if I teach Matt that one plus one equals three, and then he goes and te he teaches somebody else that one plus one is three, and he teaches somebody else that one plus one is three. And it goes on for a, you know, a couple generations or a couple people. And they start saying, oh, wait, why is one plus one equal three? All these people are saying one plus one equals two. And they go, oh, well, that's just how we've always done it, right? So obviously that's the correct answer because we've always done it that way. But if I was incorrect in my original, the original teaching, and there was error passed down to Matt, just because we've continued an error for that long, does not make it correct. Uh, there's a saying that says, don't cling to a mistake just because you spent so long making it, right? Usually my mom would say, yeah, I'm not taking you out. But, okay. um, just because we've always done it some way doesn't mean that is that is correct. We need to always bring it back to what does the Bible say. So this verse here, verse 8, Beware lest any men spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit, after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. He's bringing it down to his base level, saying, Don't let anyone carry you off as a treasure won in battle. Don't let anyone carry you off as things they have taken from you because they beat you in battle. Um, because they've won with flawed human wisdom, born out of tradition or the very basics. Be careful that you don't get tricked. Don't get deceived or fall for lies. Don't let your pride consume you and say, oh, I have all this knowledge. The Bible can't be right because of everything that I know, right? Everything that I know, I'm going to take and try and put above the Bible. We have all of these extra things. It can't be just as simple as belief in Christ, right? You have to do something else, right? Don't let your pride let you cling to a mistake you've made just because you spent a long time making it. So the philosophers of the day, um, and this is part of the Essenes and the, the, the thoughts among, among those times, uh, they were not content with everybody knowing the truth. 
They said that you had to have some secret wisdom. You have to come to me because I know more. And yet, you know, I'm not going to tell you until you're, you know, you're sitting here under me. I won't tell you the answers to the, to the universe. So you've been sitting under me for a while, and you've paid your dues, and you know, I have my new pool, right? <laughs> you have to have some secret wisdom that you're, you're not ready for, but we are. We have it, right? The Colossian church was saved out of that type, type of thing that was very predominant in that area of the world at the time. Uh, they were in danger of falling back into it. Yet in Paul, in each of his warnings, he warns them that all you need is Christ. The entirety of chapter 2 is about Christ's sufficiency. Or, well, uh, verse 8 and beyond. Um, yeah, verse 8 down. Is that all you need is Christ. It is Christ plus nothing equals salvation. Christ is all you need. Uh, you're established. We have a strong foundation in Christ. Build on that. Build on uh, so every single major heresy that has ever come up, come up throughout from the history of, of the world, every single thing that and do you guys know what I mean by when I say heresy? What is what is what is heresy means? What define it for me? Yeah, but much broader than that. Unbiblical teaching. Unbiblical teaching, right? Somebody coming in and saying, "Hey, this is what the Bible says," or. You know, this is what I say about Christ and trying to equate it with, with Christ. Or we're trying to equate it with the Bible. And saying this is accurate. It's basically, heresy is a lie about God or the Bible. Right? Every single major lie, every single major false religion that has come about attacks two things. They will attack either one or both of those things, depending on which one they are. Depending on how much of heresy they're going to want. They will attack the duality or the deity of Christ, um, they will say that Jesus wasn't actually God, or Jesus wasn't actually human. He was one or the other. Most of the time you're going to say Jesus was not God, he was just a good person. The other one that they will attack is his sufficiency for salvation. They will say, yeah, Jesus was good, Jesus was God, yep, yeah, he died for our sins. However, you also have to tithe in order to be saved, or you also have to be baptized in order to be saved. You also have to uh, confess to a priest that you're going to be saved. But is any of that true? No, none of that. Because it's Christ plus nothing equals salvation. Jesus Christ is sufficient for salvation, and that is it. End all, be all. You need nothing else. Um, every, if anybody ever comes to you and says, oh, hey, this is what I believe, and they, are and they do not agree that Jesus is sufficient for all, that Jesus is the only way to be saved, and him plus nothing is the only way to be saved, or if they are attacking that Jesus was not God, or and not human, literally ignore them. Just walk away. Because everything else after that is going to be a lie. Everything else after that is rooted in a lie. And then not only is Jesus fully God, um, as Spencer was talking about earlier, and I'm not going to get back into that one, um, but Jesus is fully God. Um, take my pick. There is nothing else that we need besides Jesus for salvation. We are complete in Him. We are sufficient for Him. Uh, verses 11 and 12. In whom also are ye circumcised in the circumcision made without hands, and putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, buried with him in baptism, wherein ye also arise, with, you are risen with him through the faith in the operation of God, but raised him from the dead. This is God setting us apart. This is God taking us and setting us apart from the world, saying, you guys are mine. I have marked you, you are special, you are mine. Verses 13 to 15, uh, And you being dead in your sins, and the uncircumcision of your blood, flesh, have they quickened together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. And having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a show of them openly, triumphing over him. I really like what people were saying earlier about the triumph, about the, Jesus had a procession, right? He went in. And he is praised. That was, I can't do that justice because I mean, it, was, it, was, it was amazing. I really, really enjoyed that. Verses 13 to 15 is God taking on our sins and fully forgiving us. Now I have an illustration here. Okay. What color is this? Daisy. 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 Daisy.
colors. Is this? It is red. Uh, almost, maybe. It's red. How do we know that it's red? Our eyes can see it. We can see it written on the marker that it's a red marker. It's, it's what we're told. It's what's kind of been passed down. Uh, I don't know if you guys know this, but every number is assigned, or every color is assigned a number. Um, I meant to look this up, so these numbers are going to be incorrect. But let's say this one was 1,034, right? Let's just say that was the color. We can prove, and you, you can screenshot, you can look at stuff, and it will pull up like a paint code, right? My wife does this all the time. She does a specific paint code because that's the color that she wants to match it on. <laughs> um, we can know that this is red because the number on it is 1034, right? What color is this? Okay. 1,035. Uh, I don't know. That'll make some sense. What if I... Well, what if I was up here trying to tell you, now this is red. No, that's blue. Oh, that's green. You're colorblind. What? Well, no, you may be colorblind, right? But this is, this is red right here. This isn't red. That's not red. That can't be red. This is red. You call it But what color is it? It's, it's red. blue. Blue, right? How do we know this is not red? Because it's not red. Because it's not red, right? Because it's that boils down to it. Because it is not red. Okay. Well, what if I have my, you know, my blue down here, and I add some add red to it, right? What color is this? It, say this was paint, it was mixed around, right? Purple. Okay. Oh no, that's red. Do you not see the red right here? Yeah, but it's not. It's purple. Yeah. But can't you say, but there's red right there. So this is red, right? This has to be red. Okay. Sure. Sure. But is this actually red? No, why? Because this is red. We know that this is red, right? We can assign numbers to these ones as well and prove that it's not there. Say, oh, uh, last one. <laughs> what color is this one? Red. Green. Green. But it's red. red. It says red right here. It's green. You see, I call it red. Right here. It's red. But come on, that, I mean, it says red. Do you guys not? Do we need to teach us? Green. 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 So what color? Yeah. It's green. It's green. But but I mean, what if I'm actually trying to convince you that this is red? But you'd say that I, I I don't know what I'm talking about, right? That I don't know. I don't know anything. But how do we know that all of these colors are not red? Because we know what red looks like. Because we know what red looks like. Because this is red. Right? Nothing else can be red because that is. I can go through the hundreds of different colors out there. I can mix up and get a, a, a paint wheel up here and paint hundreds of different colors and try and convince you that each one of them is red. But what's your response going to be every time? Yeah. It's not red. Because it's How are we going to know it's not red? Because we know that this is red. Because this is red, nothing else can be red. It doesn't matter how many. It doesn't matter how many colors we have out here. All right, bring it down. This is what I believe the crux of the books, of the, of the book, of why Paul wrote Colossians. Because Paul here doesn't give a detailed breakdown of each heresy that we're ever going to find, of that we're ever going to find, right? Paul doesn't even just say the name of it. We, we think that it's Essenes, that's just what it makes sense, that it, it's most likely the Essenes, but we don't know for sure, we don't know 100%, right? Because Paul never says it. Paul does not spend the book fighting against the heresy that the church is in. He spends parts of it, he says, hey, this is incorrect, here's what's correct. However, he spends the book proving that this is red. He spends the book proving that Christ is God. All you need is Christ. He goes, this is red. 
So that way, whenever you are faced with anything else, anything in this world that you're faced with, that they try and tell you, oh, this is red. See, it's even got red in it, right? It's mostly red. But you, go, you can go, no, this is not red, because I know this is red. Nothing else will be red. Nothing else can be true, because we have the truth right here. Every single word in here is true. Nothing else that contradicts this will is true, because we know what the truth is. So much human wisdom, so much philosophy, so many people who are the smartest people in the world, and they spend so much time trying to understand people, and trying to understand things, and come up with their own philosophy, and come up with their own way of thinking, will try and tell you, every single one of them will try and tell you that this is red. Or they'll try and tell you that this is red and point out that, hey, it even says red. Can you not see it? And they will try and make you feel small or little or try to make you feel dumb for not thinking that this is red. <laughs> However, you know that this is red. We have the truth right here. This is all we need. This is why we spend so much time in the Word of God. This is why we spend two to three hours of, in the morning, you know, one, one, to, one to three hours in the morning, one to three hours in the night, um, talking about one chapter, a single chapter. And really, we go through at night, what, a couple verses, six, seven verses usually, and, and pull one point out. In youth group, we go through a book, and it takes us years. Seven years it took me to go through John. Seven years. Because we need to know that this is true. We need to know that this is what's red. That way, whenever anybody comes to try and tell us that that one on the, on the corner, oh, that's red, we can point at them and go, no, I know that can't be true because this is what's true. We don't need to spend our entire lives studying false religion. We can and we do. That way we have... We have answers for them. Like, okay, well, we know why this is not true. We know why you, what you believe, and we know why that's not true. However, the majority of apologetics, the majority of people, do not focus on the error, error in other religions. The error in what people are teaching. They focus on the truth. Because if you hold the truth up, and you hold it up and, and show everybody, it's easy to see what is not true. If I'm up here, and I try and hold this back a little bit, and you guys don't see this, right? And you in the back could possibly be persuaded that this might be red, right? If I'm sitting here and holding it unsteady and blowing around, you can't really see in the back bar. But if we hold up the truth, you can easily see there's a difference between these two colors. You can easily see that this one is red, not that one. Holding everything up to the light, Everything up to the light of God's word will show the truth. Do you know what the average time of two minutes with Pete is? Yeah. <laughs> it's, like it's like 13 minutes or something along those lines. Is somebody keeping a chart? <laughs> but get in there, right? uh, the, every time I average it, it's been like 10 minutes to like 15 or 16, right? Why do you think we go over the two minute time period? Because two minutes. Because two minutes is not enough. Exactly. Part of the reason why I love this youth group, and part of the reason why I love coming Sunday nights and Wednesday nights, and why I miss Sunday mornings, right? I got asked to teach a class, and I love doing that. I really love getting into the Word and, and going through this fun class. But I miss Sunday mornings down here because we spend so much time getting into what is actually true, the truth of the Word. We are, you guys are taught what is true, not told what is true in this youth group. There is a major difference, and I can see that in my job, right? People will come in and they don't know a lot of things just because they were told how to do something. You were told how to do this. If I tell you, if I tell Matt that, hey, one plus one is two, right? And I send him on his way, and I don't show him how one plus one equals two, if Caden comes up and goes, oh, hey, no, one plus one actually means three, he, he doesn't know what he's talking about, and he has a four-point paragraph chart about it, and he has a diagram, how one plus one equals three, will Matt fall for that? Yeah. He's going to, right? Because that's persuasive. Those are enticing words. He's being enticed by, he's being beguiled by enticing words. 
because I didn't do my job, because I didn't teach him, I merely told him. Being told is like those trees out there not having roots. If I just tell you something, any wind that comes across is going to blow you down. Teaching you is getting those roots in. That way when somebody comes up and tries to say that this is red, you know that that is not because you know what red is. You have to have an understanding of the truth before you can spot the lies. So what is the takeaway from this? What's the most important thing that we can study? The Bible. And why is that? Because it's the truth. And everything else we can compare to the Bible. But we can't compare it to it unless we know what it says. Most heresy, most people that lie about, um, about God and, and try and, and fit in their own thing and their own stuff, they will cherry pick verses. They will come out and pick one verse and take half of it and say, hey, this is what this means, right? Ignoring the entirety of the context. And I am completely blanking on normal ones right now, so you can give me an example. But if you know the context, if you read it, if you know the truth, even though they try and mix in a little bit of red with their lie, you will go, hey, this is not red. It's not purely red, which means it's not red. I know what red is. I know what the truth is because I have, I have studied it. Get into the word and know why you believe what you believe. Right? My challenge to you guys is this, as a camp group and then as a youth group of, uh, more specifically. Over the next several days, I will give several points, a plethora of points, a buku amount of points, if you will, to anybody who can come to me and explain why they believe a doctrine, why they, why they are saved. If you can come to me and say, hey, I am saved, here is how and here is why. And explain to me the process of why you are saved, how you are saved. Come to me, explain that doctrine. If you can't, then ask us. This is what we're here for. We are here to teach you. Uh, if we don't know the answers, then we'll ask Pete who usually knows the answers. Right? <laughs> if I don't know the answer to something, I will tell you, I'm not sure. Let me go find out, and we'll work through it together. But if you ask me you know, the basic ones, right? Well, how, how do I know I'm saved? If you can't explain that, come to us and ask, and we will show you. We will give you the words. We will give you what is read. Everything that we tell you we will, is going to be read. Me, Pete, Brandon, Adriana, the Shrew, every, every one of the leaders here. We will never purposefully mislead you. I don't think most of us would unpurposely mislead you. We're very rooted in the truth because we know what that is. And then, once you, that's the basic building block, right? Once you know why and how you are saved, and you can explain that, you're firm on that, that is unshakable, go to the next doctrine. Go to, hey, this is what I believe. Do I know why I believe? If you cannot explain why you believe something, get into the word and figure it out. That way when people come up to you and try and shake you and try and go, oh, that's not true, and they try and convince you that something else is red, you will know why. The teens who attend, attend Temple Teens, right? You come Sunday nights, Wednesday nights. Um, I don't know if you guys know this, but I will be teaching a lot of July. Um, Sunday nights and Wednesday nights in July will be moving on. Do you, do you care if they know? No. Okay, yeah, yeah. He's going to be traveling the Midwest. He's going to load up the camper and take his family on a vacation. Um, when was the last time you took a massive vacation like that? Never. Never, yeah. This is a three, four week vacation that he's going to be gone to be a blessing to him and his family, to recharge him. Um, and, and, right? Woo. Right? But the teams at, at camp, I have been searching what I wanted to, to go on, what I wanted to talk about, right? What I want to teach and what I want to talk about is going to come from tonight. I want you guys to come and, ex and tell me, hey, I, this is what I believe, but I can't explain to somebody else why I believe. Think about the doctrines that we believe. Think about what you believe, you, you teens that attend there, right? Come to me and say, hey, you know what? I don't know why I believe this. And this is what I want to teach on while Pete's away. What we have that you cannot explain. That way we can give you the tools. We can give you, we can give you what is read. That way everybody else or everything else falls away. 
Think about, you know, that baptism doesn't save. Do you know why we take communion? Can you explain to somebody why we take communion? Um, it could be simple things as, why is it a sin to lie? Uh, why it's not okay to mutilate yourself and try and claim you're the opposite gender? Do you know why that is wrong? Uh, do you know why we believe that Jesus is God? We covered that a little bit yesterday. I uh, spoke about that one. But come explain the doctrines to me, for everybody that's here. Come and choose a doctrine. Hey, this is what I believe. This is why I believe it. Explain it to me, and you'll get several points, right? And if there's nothing that you can do that with, then come and ask us. Like, hey, I don't know this. Can you teach me? Can you show me? That is what we're here for. The games and, and everything else is fun. And this is the highlight of my week for a lot of those things. But the true highlight of my week are these nights, right? Every other night that I'm not teaching, it's because I am taking in so much work. I mean, I enjoy teaching as well. I want to go through and help you guys with this. Pastor Pete wants to go through and help you guys with this. My hope is that you guys will say, hey, these are the things that I don't know, that we have a good enough list that I can pass on to Pastor Pete afterwards, right? Because this, this is what, when, when you guys leave this YouTube, when you guys leave on Saturday and turn back on your phone to get the 4,000 messages that are waiting for you, there's going to be some that are going to be challenging what you believe. Whether it's asking you to, or trying to convince you to join in something you shouldn't, or trying to get you to lie, or trying to get you to do something you don't know, or you don't, that is not correct. You could go, you know what, I'm not going to do that because I know what's true. I know what is red. You trying to tell me that this is red is not going to work anymore. Right? Get into God's Word. Know why you believe what you believe. Get into this. It will shape the rest of your life. It will help the rest of your life. Take it from somebody who sat under good teaching, decent teaching, as a teen, and then did not follow through for several years. One of my biggest regrets in life is those wasted few years where I wasn't in God's Word. I wasn't living for what He said. Don't make those same mistakes. Get into and know why you believe what you believe, and you won't be shaken when it tries to time stop. Questions, comments, concerns? You do close the prayer? Yes, let's pray. Father, we're so thankful for your word and how it is the truth. And we can hold it and everything up to it and the light that comes from it and truth is revealed in each matter. I pray that we would take Kyle up on his challenge. That we would examine what we believe and why and seek to explain it to someone so that they might know. Yes, the points are, are great, but so that we might have a better understanding of the doctrine. And if we don't understand or if there are questions about it, may we be bold enough to ask, knowing we won't be mocked, knowing we won't be laughed at or anything, but out of a sincere desire to learn. Father, may we be wary of enticing words and being spoiled and human philosophy, rudiments of this world. May we focus on your word and dig in. Bless us now, praise in Christ's name. Amen.